John Brownlee here to bring us the word this morning. I'm sure many of you <laughs> know him. Let's give him a little warm welcome here. to the law, men were required to attend three festivals a year in Jerusalem. One of them, which was probably the most popular, was Tabernacles. That was the harvest festival, so Thanksgiving, okay? But then after Thanksgiving, after you've done all of this work of the harvest, you would spend time camping out. You'd make shelters for yourself, and the family would stay together and celebrate. So it was a really positive festival. Then there was the most attended festival. Do you know what that would be? Passover. No, Pentecost. And the reason it was the most attended is that's when it was the easiest to travel. Because you can get people from all over Europe and um, the Middle East. They could travel, and because of that, it really drew a lot of people, and it was short. So, and just for trivia. So you never know when you're playing Trivia Pursuit and you know, a Bible question comes up. Do you know that Pentecost in the Old Testament was considered the day that Moses was given the law. So that was Pentecost. So therefore, in our Pentecost, you have the new law, more or less. The new covenant is established. The old covenant in the, with Moses gets established on Pentecost. The new covenant gets established with Jesus the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church. Then there is Passover. Passover was a serious festival, and it recalled that the angel of death was going to punish Egypt for not letting the keeping them as slaves. So therefore, the oldest child of every family, and even of all the animals, were, was going to die, unless they put blood on the door and on the, the lentil and the, the top of the door. And I always like to try to point this out. I mean, out of all of you who are here, how many of you are the oldest in your family? <laughs> Just me? They take out the best and the brightest. <laughs> so, but anyway, when I do that in churches, I mean, it's amazing how many people raise their hand. So you wouldn't have made it without the majority. And then, of course, they, they cross the Red Sea, and many miracles have been done. So Passover is a time to recall all of this. And what we read in the scripture is that Jesus' family, Mary and Joseph, were frequent attenders at Passover. Now, if you're living in Nazareth and you got to get to Jerusalem four days 
80 miles at least to get there. And you wouldn't just go by yourself. And remember, there are no buses, there are no trains, there's no planes. So people who are going have to travel together. And therefore, so let's just say we were going to Boston, okay, from this church. Well, you know, um, we would decide, well, okay, this group is going to be in the first group, and we're going to have a caravan, and the men will be here, and the women and children will be there, and when you combine all of that, we do it for the safety. Although, you know what I heard? I heard that the women were put first, and then the men behind them. That seems to be kind of cowardly in my view, but what can I tell you? They had a caravan, so they would go in sections. The um, Mary and Joseph went every year, and this is a special year, because Jesus has turned 12 years old. When you turn 12 as a man, as a boy, you were to start taking the law seriously. Have you ever heard of the Jewish ceremony, the bar mitzvah? That would take place when the, the boy turned 13. And at that point, at 13, the boy is considered a man. So, and when they turn 12, you're supposed to learn your stuff. So when you turn 12, that is a year of intense study of the law. So that when you turn 13, you will go through a ceremony and be recognized as a man responsible for following the law. So Mary, Joseph, Jesus, they're all... And, and the rest of Nazareth, they're, they're all in there enjoying their time together. And at this point, what is interesting is that Jesus stays behind. According to the scriptures, it says he lingered behind in Jerusalem. But there's no details given. I mean, did Jesus not have a watch? You know, he didn't know. Or did they, he's supposed to be someplace and did he get confused? Did his parents get confused? No, no details. Did Jesus lose track of time because he was enjoying himself so much? So Mary and Joseph go, and Mary thinks that Jesus is with the men. Joseph thinks that Jesus is with the women and children. So they go a day's travel in the caravan. Then they stop. And then they, to their horror, they find that Jesus is missing. Now, not, imagine if this was your kid, okay? I, parents, when I was talking about this to some parents, they say, oh, yeah, I remember one time uh, I couldn't find my kid in the mall. Know? And uh, oh, that was terrifying because you know you start to think, what happened, you know? And particularly in this day and age, I want to make this clear that this is at home alone. Okay, <laughs> just some that, that Mary and Joseph were just negligent, all right, careless. What happened to Jesus? Now there's possibilities. If you had your kid in the mall and you couldn't find the kid, you might think that somebody kidnapped him. Okay? Um, did he get in a fight somewhere? Uh, are people, uh, is Jesus now lost? Did Jesus get lost? And if he's lost, he's alone. And I don't know, at this age, I might get really emotional. You know, I, I'd be weeping. And, well, what happens if I was coming, and then I fell and got hurt, and I'm just lying somewhere, and nobody knows where I am. 
can't imagine. So Mary, who will do all the talking in this story, she describes herself in intense emotional pain. It is the exact word in Greek that is used for the rich man in hell. When he looks up and he says, I am in agony, I am in torment in these flames. That's how Mary describes her emotions. It is like a, a horrified panic that she's going through. All right. They didn't notice that Jesus was missing for a day. So then they recognized, well, we got to go back to Jerusalem to find him. So it's another day back to retrace their steps. That's day two. Jerusalem's a, you know, a decent-sized city, so where might he be? I would assume that the first place they went is to wherever they were uh, camping out, wherever they um, were there. I will be preaching the next time I'm here on the triumphal entry. And one of the things that's interesting is that Jerusalem had maybe 20,000, 50,000, somewhere like that. But at Passover, because everybody's got to be there, all of a sudden, there's 500,000 people there. It is gigantic with where people would stay, and they would find places to camp. And so I would assume Mary and Joseph went there. There's nothing there. Eventually, they decide that they will go to the temple where they will find Jesus. So Jesus is missing for three days. Does three days bring a bell to him? So I don't know if there's any imagery that's coming out of this, but Jesus was in the tomb for three days. He's lost here for three days. And then they find Jesus. They find Jesus in the temple. And what Jesus is doing, he is participating in a discussion of Scripture. Uh, the way... Scripture was primarily taught was through question and answer. So what would be going on is some rabbis, the teachers of the law would be asking questions and people would be asking them questions and there would be a, like a give and take of answers. And so Jesus, and what's really important because I've seen a lot of pictures of paintings of this, like Jesus is sitting front and center and all of the, 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 you know, the teachers of the law, they're circling around him, listening to Jesus. That couldn't have been what it was. You know, it's Jesus is smart. You know, I always say, he wrote the law, so he would know the law, so he would understand it. And as he's there, he's not your average 12 year old. As he is listening and learning, he's making some really deep comments. And he's asking some great questions. And it, it, to such an extent that people are astonished at how smart he is. This kid's 12 years old, and he understands things like this? Wow. And... Mary and Joseph look at this, and they see him. And Mary and Joseph are relieved, obviously, to find him. But they're frustrated, you know? Now, I don't know if... Did Jesus do something wrong? Now, we know he didn't disobey his parents. Because if he disobeyed his parents, he sinned. If he sinned, what are we doing here on Super Bowl Sunday? You know, come on, you know. But he couldn't have sinned. But they're frustrated. 
Yeah, they, they lost Jesus at the mall, but they didn't, it's not the mall. They have no idea where he's doing three days to find him. So you can imagine how relieved on one hand Mary and Joseph are. But it's their time to straighten Jesus out. And Mary, and there's no other way to say it, rebukes Jesus, complains to Jesus. Why'd you do this to us? Your father and I have been in torment searching for you. No way around it. Mary is complaining about Jesus and his behavior. Now, what Jesus does is he kind of has a smile on his face as his parents are looking at him. You, you know, I wasn't lost. I mean, you, you really didn't have to have this big search for me. Where else would I be but here in the family? Because I must be about the business of my father. And I always wondered how Joseph took that. You know, Mary says, your father and I have been in torment, and where were you? And he says, well, I was doing the business of my father. So I always feel that Joseph, no matter what happens, is always getting the short end of the stick. And of course, his Mary is doing all the talk. But when Jesus says that, you know, where else would I be? I'd be in the temple. I have to be about my father's business. I remember, now I'm the oldest of six kids, and so I'm, I'm growing up, and I think I'm pretty smart, you know? And I know that there are multiple times when I would give what I considered my wisdom to my parents, and they would say, huh? <laughs> That's the response, because as Jesus shares this, Mary and Joseph are confused. It is always interesting. Remember, if, I know we put all the Christmas decorations away and all that. Um, but you realize that March 25th is coming. March 25th is nine months before Christmas. So it is the Feast of the Annunciation. So Jesus is in Mary's womb on March 25th. So the Christmas season begins on March 25th. All right, just, just to let you know, you can get out your Christmas CDs and you can just enjoy it. And I'm sure going to the mall, you can see all the Christmas decorations starting to come back out. But what is amazing to me is the phrase that we sing in the Christmas song, Mary, did you know? So what did Mary know? Now, Mary would have to be confused here because she knows that she is giving birth to the Messiah. Right? That's what she knows. There's a great line in that song. It says, when you kiss the little baby, did you know that you were kissing the face of God? And my answer is, no, she didn't know. There was nobody knew that Jesus was God. They thought he would be the Messiah, big, you know, leader. And, but the, the idea that the Messiah would be God himself, no one caught that. No one. Anyway, so she's confused, and you're trying to figure out, Mary, okay, what, when she, he says this, I must be about my father's business, what does she think and what does she know? Because isn't Joseph the father? And I don't know. Anyway, after the, huh? What's he talking about? All now is well. They return to Nazareth. Jesus is a good boy growing up and everything. So, I want to read the text, which is in 
Luke chapter 2, and I want to begin with verse 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. And so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to seek him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. These are the first recorded words of Jesus. All right, the first thing he says. Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, I know you hate stuff like this. It frustrates me. But there's a translation problem in this sentence. Because what it says in Greek is this. In the of my father. In the of my father. What's the the? You know, what, what it, the, the, it's a, what's it supposed to be uh, in front of? So a lot of the, the um, translations translate in the house of my father. Because why? Because Jesus is in the temple and the temple is the house of father. So, but other translations have something like in the things of my father, in the matters of my father. Uh, so you could translate it in the things of my father or my father's business. I have to be about my father's business. I like the second one because there's a clear word for the temple that wasn't used. So this would make more sense to me in the Greek, but you couldn't care less about that. But the question that is crucial here is what is the business of the Father? Because if Jesus is about the business of the Father, shouldn't we be about the business of the Father? So, we have to look at what Jesus is doing here, and we know he's in the temple, but the first thing we see is that Jesus is involved in Bible study. Bible study. Jesus is bringing some new understandings to the law, that he's bringing about new covenant ideas, he's proclaiming the new covenant. But Jesus is involved in Bible study. Now, all I gotta say is, if Jesus is involved in Bible study, how much more do we need to be involved in Bible study? 
I got a chance to do my granddaughter's wedding this year. And so I'm giving the, the message. And as I'm giving the message, I see my granddaughter, and I remember her from, you know, <laughs> on the day she was born, I remember. And here I am, you know, an old guy in front of her doing the, and I just want to recognize that if you really want a good marriage, you really need to have this word to be part of you. And I said to her, you know, her name's Amber. I said, you know, Amber, I wish I could just take the Bible and just wave it over your head three times and you would know what you need to know. But it doesn't work that way. This is a book. The way you get a book into your head is by reading it. There's no simple way of getting the Bible into you. We have to know our stuff. So we have to read it. We have to listen to it in, in situations like this. You can watch video and film of the Bible a lot these days. You can study it. But for and I'm sure Pat has shared what to do and how to do it and whatever. I'm going to throw my two cents in. First thing, people say, what version should I read? And I said, the one that you're going to read. Mm -hmm. All right? Simple as that. So therefore, some people think they want to do the King James, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's kind of like Shakespearean English. And not everybody handles Shakespeare well. Okay? Other people want to use a, a very contemporary new translation, but sometimes it's too simple. There was one translation I remember for the word mercy. They translated the word mercy. Now, how hard is it to know what mercy is, right? They translated it pity. I'm going, no, 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 no. I mean, there's a difference between mercy and pity, and I wouldn't, you know, use them interchangeably. Some people have a, a, a Bible that was given to them by the grandparents. Some people um, really like a certain study Bible, and they want, the, you know, so they'll say, I, I was just talking to somebody, Pat, who wanted the Spurgeon study Bible. And said, I said, well, I know that's in the contemporary, um, the, the, the Christian standard Bible, but I don't know if it's in anything else. And, and sure enough, it's in the King James, too. But it's not in the New King James. So whatever you're going to like to read and sit through, that's the one you should use. Right? Number one. Number two. Now, I don't know about you, but isn't there a couple thousand pages in this, <laughs> you know? Now, how do you get this into you? And particularly, where in the world do you start? Now, I have a suggestion. And what I suggest to people is something like this. Now, they're called graphic novels these days. There's an action Bible or something like that. What you do is, okay, it would help you to learn some of the Old Testament easy. Now, I recommend to people, for instance, I'll give you an example. At my church, I was starting to teach the Old Testament. And so I'm going to start in Genesis. Uh, I, before I was done, we were at Solomon, okay? And went through all of the Old Testament. And while we're going through 
it. The way I decided to start it was with the Gospel of Luke. And I just read chapter one of Luke. And it was all of the images of the Old Testament that Luke expected that you would know before as he started to tell the story. You know, he started to tell the story. There's Zechariah, who's a priest, and he's in the temple, and he's going to do a, uh, an offering of incense, and he's going to be in front of the Holy of Holies. And a, the angel Gabriel, who was the angel of the end times in Daniel, okay? He's the one who appears to him. You need to know a little bit about the Old Testament. I think going through something like this, to just get some background into the Old Testament would be extremely helpful to people. Uh, what I recommend to people when they say, I say, if I were doing this, the first thing I would do would be I would read the New Testament. The second thing I would do, I would read the Old Testament and the New Testament together. And then following that, I would do the Old Testament. Now that'll take you maybe decades <laughs> to do all that. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. You know, when I do my devotions and, and read scripture, I see things that I hadn't seen before. I preached here on the prodigal son. And this has messed me up. When the father talks to the older brother who's complaining that you, know, you never did anything for me, I've been slaving for you all these years. What is interesting is that the father says, you've always been with me and everything I have is yours. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, we like to think of the older son as the Pharisees and the bad guy. Then how can father say something so sweet. Are the Pharisees really with Jesus? Are the Pharisees who get such bad press? You know? Is everything theirs that God has to give? It's just interesting. It's been messing me up since I read that a couple of weeks ago. Particularly. What I recommend the People say, where do you start? I would start with the Gospel of Mark. And then maybe from there go to the Acts of the Apostles. Gospel of Mark, you get a real quick view of Jesus without a lot of red letters. So you just get to see who Jesus is and what he did. And then when you get to the Acts, you just get to see how much fun it is to be a Christian. And all the stuff that God does through his people, and then you go, hey, I'm ready. In fact, one of the uh, people who started reading Acts said, this is great. When do we get a chance to start doing it? All right? That's the concept. <clears throat> so therefore, what I would recommend is it doesn't really matter where you start or how you start. There's no right or wrong answer. But how else you can get this into your head unless you read? You will find a Bible that you definitely are going to read, that you're attracted to on some level. And then be patient. Pat and I, we talk. You read faster than I do. When you, I mean, you do. And, and, and one of the things that we talk about is, I always go, some people gulp scripture, some people sip. I'm a sipper, you know? I go slow, I think about what I'm reading, I'm in no hurry, and I don't care if, it ever, if I ever get through Luke. You know, that's all right. My wife reads faster than I do. She reads bigger chunks. Who's right and who's wrong? My wife always says she's right. But, um, <laughs> on many things. But the, the, the difference really is it doesn't matter how God has wired you differently than he wired
wired me. And what works for me might not necessarily work for you. So there's many ways to do it, but all I know is that Jesus was in Bible study. Jesus was under being 12 years old. He needed to learn the scriptures better, the law better. It's a lifelong study. It's a lifelong challenge. But there just ain't no way to get it in you unless you read it. Simple as that. Okay? The second thing that's interesting about being about the Father's business is that if Jesus is in the temple, the temple is a house of prayer. So if Jesus is hanging around the temple, there are specific prayer services and, that are being done. According to the scriptures, the temple was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. Now there's a lot of different ways to pray. And again, this is as different as wired differently. A friend of mine <coughs> had uh, his wife was pregnant. So on Wednesday, she's in the hospital. Okay. So he says, will you pray for my wife? She's going to have the baby today. Okay. So I start praying and then he contacts me a little while later and says, She's hardly contracting at all, okay? So can you pray that, you know, her contractions will increase? Okay. So I do pray some more. Then I get this, you got to pray. Um, she was in pain, and they gave her uh, a spinal. No. And they gave her too much. So she's sleeping, and the baby's heart rate has gone down. And they said that the heart rate was dangerously down. So John, can you pray? Sure. Okay. <laughs> and um, so then the baby's heart rate started to come back up, and everything was fine. But the baby's still inside, the mom, right? So he says... Can you continue to pray? So I said, sure. So after I watched the movie, I was done. I said, okay, I'm going to pray. And I fell asleep praying. Barb woke me up and said, time to go. And um, I think I prayed about five hours that day. Now, people pray in different ways. I prayed for five hours. Some people like to pray specific liturgical prayers, the prayers of the church. And uh, those of you who have watched The Chosen, have you noticed how many times the apostles pray together? And when they pray, they all know the prayers. There's specific words that they use because those are the prayers of the people of God. Uh, some people... Uh, pray in silence. Some people uh, pray like, I like to pray a lot of times like I'm talking to you. When I talk to God, I'm not any different than I'm talking to you. And um, sometimes you're sad when you pray. You really feel broken. Sometimes you're angry with God when you pray. Now, th there was a time with me, with, with prayer, I remember I, I said to God, he said, okay, Lord, you said that you want me to come to you in prayer like a child. I said, any child that's worth his salt will throw a temper tantrum. Here comes mine, okay? And I would unload, you know? And, like, and I always felt that after I unloaded to God, God would say to me, do you feel better now, John? You got that off your chest. 
Okay? Now watch what I'm going to do. So sometimes you say, sometimes you people have some real personal interaction with God. Sometimes you're like, but prayer is everything. Mm -hmm. Prayer is how we connect with God. Mm -hmm. Jesus is in the temple, and the temple is the house of prayer for all nations. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the Father's business. Then the next part is the temple is the center for the worship of God. It's where the sacrifices are, where the choirs were, where prayers were said, where blessings were given. Now, as you come here today, how, Paula, how did you choose the music? I knew that you were starting my time. Okay. So, words that would connect with where I was going. Okay. That's great. And uh, so, therefore, if you're coming here and I got this message, the music is going to reinforce the message. Not only are you praising God, but it's going to reinforce the message that you're hearing. You know, I. I don't know how many sermons I've done. Thousands, okay? And what is always amazing to me is somebody will come up to me afterwards and will say, oh, you were speaking right to me. And my honest response, if I gave it, was I didn't give you a second thought while I was putting this together. But the Holy Spirit used what the scriptures would say in the sermon to drive home a point, to get, maybe comfort you, maybe to challenge you, um, you know, and that is the point when we worship. Now, all of you have spiritual gifts, and we don't all have the same spiritual gifts. I need your gifts, you need my gifts. And we need to be able to share that with each other. We need to be able to know each other. You know, what the whole Christian life is not about God needing to populate heaven. It's about God putting together a people for his name through whom he works. So sometimes you're here and you, and you need someone to encourage you. Sometimes you might need uh, someone to speak directly into a situation. What I find the most interesting for me is I can't believe how many times when I go to churches, people go up to my wife or to me and say, will you pray about? And so I pray. And we learn the different concerns that people have. But worship not only helps us, but it puts our focus on God. And as we put our focus on God, God works in us and through us. So when we worship, not only do we learn, not only do we grow, not only does God give us gifts that can be used. What I did in my church is we always had open prayer in the church. And most people, when they give prayer concerns, somebody's sick, right? I and mean, that's the number one thing people want prayer for. So what we would do is we would get up and I would say, okay, okay, everybody over here pray over mine. Everybody over here pray over Pat. Everybody over here, pray with each other. And so people would get up and they would, you know, lay hands on things. And they would pray this general prayer. And what was always amazing to me is there would somebody would say, wow, while you were praying for me, I really felt the presence of God in my life. Or I've had people do this, you know, they, they have their the hand and they'll go, whose hand is this? Because this is really hot. 
There's this one guy in my church. He was an older guy, and he had a bad shoulder, like, like a bursitis type stuff. And this woman, very mild woman, just laid hands, and he said, your hand is burning. And she said, really? She feels her hand, and it's just normal. So after that, that guy never had any shoulder sort of problems for the rest of his life. I don't know what happened or how it happened, but imagine if it was your hand that was used. And you could be absolutely convinced that God used you. You know what you would do? You'd pray more. Hey, that was fun, you know? And if you pray and believe that God is going to answer your prayer, God is going to answer your prayer, and then you're going to pray more. And if that's the cycle. So the more you see God work in you and through you, the more you're going to do this. And you can't do that by yourself. There has to be a corporate dimension. God is looking for a people for his name. And we are that people. So you come here and there's a line in the, a, a hymn that speaks to you. The sermon speaks to you. Um, the, even the offering might speak to you. You know? Um, every aspect of the worship, so the greetings, you know? All of that, you start to feel God is at work here. And God is at work. God is at work in us. I've had people who've told me, we're having communion. And this is not much different than what you have, communion. The guy said to me, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but during communion, I really felt the presence of God that day. I really felt God touching me over, you know, I don't know. But when you worship, when we worship, God is moving. I wish somehow I was smart enough to know what to say to people to convince them to be Christians. I had the opportunity to lead my best friend to Christ. And he was balking at it for years and then eventually he turned his life over to Jesus. And I said to him, what did I say to finally convince you? Because I wanted to bottle it. You know, I wanted to put a trademark on it. I wanted to have a clever saying or something. And he said to me, nothing. He said, it was nothing that you said but it was everything that you were. That's how people are going to encounter God. When they see God encountering you, working through you, empowering you, and then you see it. And then no one is going to have to force you to come to church because this is where the power is. This is where God is. One more time, okay? What's more powerful than God? Nothing. Nothing's more powerful than God. Well, if God is in you, and God is in us, and God is here, this is the place to be. Right? There's nothing better. The Father's business is the study of the Word, prayer, and worship. That's what Jesus was engaged in. And it's putting our focus and our faith on who God is and what God has done and what God is doing. And when that happens, we are transformed. We become different. And when we become different through our focus on God and we can embrace that it's not about me, 
Me coming to church is not about me. It's not about our culture when I'm not in church. It's not about listening to the opinions of others. It's being about the Father's business. And he is active. And the church can't go out of business if the focus is on his business. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Wow, Jesus showed us. Jesus himself, capital G, capital O, capital B, Jesus, showed us what the business is. What we need to do. We need to engage the scriptures. We need to worship and we need to Pray. Through all of that, you will speak. Through all of that, you will move. And through all of that, you will touch each one of us. You touch us individually and personally, but that's never meant to be private. It's personal. It's about a corporate gathering where you give us gifts. We build each other up and we transform by the Holy Spirit ourselves and others. You work through us. You said, I will be your God and you will be my people. May we continue to embrace that we are the people that you're going to work through. And we know you're the answer. We know you're the hope. So the hope and power of humanity is right here, right here at Chapel on the Hill. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Let's thank you, John. Let's stand for the last hymn, and it's going to be number 413. 413.
Amen. Let's bow our heads and ask for the Lord's blessing. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would seal it to each of our hearts. That we as well would be about our Father's business. We would delight in getting into your word. And through that, your word gets into us. And we would be people of prayer. Knowing that our God, there is nothing too difficult for him. And Lord, that we would just praise you and honor you with our lives and with our lips until we take our last breath and you call us home to be with you forever. So bless your people, O oh Lord, this week as we go out to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. That he came died on the cross for the sins of the world. He was buried and three days later was raised from the dead. And that gives us hope, not only for this life, but for the life to come. So Father, we pray for your help as we go out this week. May your blessing and favor be upon us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Bless you.